We have the great privilege to, to welcome uh, uh, Dame Fiona Caldicott today in this virtual uh, discussion that we have in, at Somerville College. Uh, and well, basically, the, the topic of today is going to be very, very topic with the current situation. So it's going to be about privacy versus prevention, the ethics of information. So, so just before we start, I just wanted to say a few words about our distinguished speaker to, today before uh, asking her a, a couple of questions. So, so, so Fiona has a very long and influential career in education and public health. So most notably, she's, she has served as Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Oxford. She's been the principal of Somerville College place where we are really here just now, but she's also been president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. But actually, well, she, she's had a very long career, but she's still very active and, and very influential. Uh, and actually today she's talking to us in her role of National Data Guardian for Health and Social Care. So, so, so this whole question of uh, personal data, the possibility to share the personal data, to get access to it, well, it's an issue that has been existing for several years, but it's gained a lot of importance in recent times due to the current coronavirus situation and, and the urging need to, to share personal data, mobility data, social contact data in order to help researchers to understand better the way the virus is spreading, but also policymakers to take the right decisions to fight against it. And actually, in today's discussion, we're going to be exploring well, the legal and ethical boundaries on data sharing, but also explore the that you could get from this data in order to help uh, well, sort out or at least sort out the situations in which we are now. So, okay, so after this short introduction, well, so welcome to all of you, first of all, but also welcome Fiona. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. And uh, if, if I may, so, so could I first ask you to explain to us what is your role of National Data Guardian for Health and Social Care? So my role is to advise and to challenge the health and care system about its use of people's health and care data. I'm an advocate for the public um, and try to give them uh, confidence that their health and care data is used appropriately and is looked after securely. So that role was established in 2014 by our Secretary of State for Health, the previous um, holder of that office, Mr. Hunt, and in 2018, it became an official statutory role in our parliament. So there is an act now which defines the role of the National Data Guardian, which Thank gives you. me more authority to advise and to have that advice taken by organisations working within our health and care system. And, and so, so actually, so a, a very central concept, if I'm correct, uh, related to these questions in the UK is the Caldicott principles. And uh, could you please explain to us what are the Caldicott principles and in which con context they've been set, set it up? So as I came to Somerville in 1996, I was asked to chair a large committee in our health service because computers were being used increasingly to put people's data into them in order to have a health record and to use the advances of technology to store the data and to use it. And particularly clinicians were worried that this meant that the data was insecure that things could go wrong with computers, the data might be lost, it might be corrupted, and it was a worrying situation for those who were used to treating people's data with great care and with to keep it confidential. So we developed six principles that would be um, good standards for using people's data and looking after it. And those were recommended to the government of the day, which accepted the principles. And we also suggested that there should be a senior clinician in each organization who would look after that data there and give advice on when it could be shared and when it could be used properly. 
and they became known as the Caldecott Guardians. And there are now 18,000 of those in England because it moved, uh, it was extended from health into social care and other parts of our public sector. And, and, and these uh, guardians, did, did all of them receive some sort of like, uh, you know, like, so formation to get prepared to their role? Increasingly, they receive training and there is a council of experienced Caldecott guardians, which uh, welcomes newcomers to the role and helps them with some of the difficult issues that can arise within their organizations. We have a complicated law in relation to data, particularly since the new GDPR came into being. And the, the guardians are very experienced at helping people to find the right way in which to safely use people's data without confidence being breached. And, and, and if I'm correct, you started by saying that there were like six uh, initial Cadican principles, but these principles have been evolving in time, I suppose, with new technologies and new needs. So, so how, how was this evolution and maybe how many principles do we have now? So we started with six which has been used extensively across the country, not just in England, but across the United Kingdom. And then in 2012-13, people became very worried that people's data, their information wasn't being used when it should be for their own treatment and care. So we developed a seventh principle, which was to say that it was as important to share data as to look after it securely. Since that time, the seven principles have been used. And in recent years, the last couple of years, we've become interested in the legal concept of reasonable expectations, which defines a situation where an average member of the public would have their expectations about a situation realized And the theme of my work has been that there should be no surprises for the public about how their data is used. So building on the no surprises, we've now developed an eighth principle, which suggests that those looking after the person's information should make sure that they understand how it's used and they can expect what is going to happen to it. They won't be surprised by how their data is used. And that is in the process of being uh, discussed widely at the moment to see if it would be helpful to people in this quite complicated arena. Yeah, I suppose so. And, and indeed, like trust and proper understanding of what the data could be used for are, are critical here. Because, well, and, and these two questions go together, right? Exactly. If you want people to trust, you want people to understand. Otherwise, that's how we go into cons some sort of Absolutely. conspiracy theory. And, and actually, in, uh, in 2016, you say that most of the people trust the NHS uh, to do the right thing, but there are still very low levels of understanding about data use and sharing. So it means that historically the people trust the NHS, but still there is a, a fairly low level of understanding of the broader public of what could be done or what has been done with that data. So do you think that today, four years later, the situation is better? And if not, what could be done to, to make it, uh, to, to improve it? So if you'd asked me that question a year or two ago, I would have said that things had not changed very much. One of the ways in which we've done our work is to go out and meet groups of the public, focus groups, we've had surveys, uh, we've looked at people's experience within their um, clinical care and so on. And one of the surprises we had a few years ago was that people really didn't know very much about how our health and care system work. So they would be quite surprised, for instance, to learn that if they went on holiday to a different part of the country, which means that a different authority was responsible for arranging their treatment, then some money had to change hands from where they lived to where they were on holiday. And that sort of thing has meant that information has been moved around without the public necessarily knowing it. So we have wanted those things to be more clear to the public. And one of the things we've learned is that 
unless people are actually ill or needing care themselves, or a member of their family does, they tend not to be very interested in these things. They get on with their lives, they have their bank accounts, they book their holidays, they do lots of things with tech, but they don't necessarily think about what happens to the information they've given to their GP or to the nurse in the clinic and so on. But I think with the increasing amount of time that the media has spent on some of these things, they have become aware that there is this issue about whether the information is looked after safely, whether it's sometimes lost, um, and is it used for their benefit? And some members of the public have quite strong views about this. And then to bring you up to date, I would say that in the last few months, the public has become much more aware. They've become, some of them, very expert on epidemiology. They've become very knowledgeable about how the health service works and who does what and why it's difficult sometimes to change things. And I would say that now, if you ask me the question, which you have, I would argue that probably that's a rather historic view of the public. And after the pandemic's over, we may find there are lots more questions and discussions about some of these things because people have day by day learned a lot about what is going on in tr order to try and defeat this disease, some of it with their information. Yes, yeah, so that would be one of the positive side effects of... Could be. Yeah, Could be. Hopefully. But, uh, and indeed, I think that the people understand, especially nowadays, that their data could be used uh, to well to to fight COVID nineteen, we're going to be back to that in, in in a few moments. But but so a question that is sometimes a bit more delicate is when data is shared with private companies. And in, in these respects, a couple of years ago in two thousand seventeen, th there was a deal between DeepMind and the NHS that was denounced by media and activists. And well, in your view, what did go wrong in that particular case? Well, in the particular example, you name, one and a half million patient records were given to Google DeepMind, mm -hmm. which was trying to develop an app to help doctors know when a patient might develop a serious disease of the kidneys. It was a very worthy aim, but people became very upset that the patients whose records those were, were not mm -hmm. asked. They weren't told that that was happening, and they certainly weren't asked. So when they discovered that, actually through the media, they were surprised. They had surprises, and some of them were very unhappy. And part of the work we did on that issue was with the hospital and with the, the company to show that legally the way in which they could have done their work was through a research project which needs special permissions in our system, but where you don't need the patient's consent. You can let them know that there's um, a project going on, but mm -hmm. you don't have to give the individual, get the individual to give consent. So it was, it was not a well-founded project. And I think people have learned a lot about when they wish to do research and use data in different ways, there are ways of getting consent. There are also ways in which they can do the work without it. And one of the things that worries our public, most of all in this um, debate, is when they feel people are making a profit from mm. the use of their information. So it's one thing if research is done for the public good, for universities or for the health service, but they become very upset if they feel that that data is being taken and used to make profit for shareholders. One of the interesting aspects of that is that people don't always realize that we wouldn't have new drugs if we didn't have big pharma companies, which actually do make a profit, but much of that is put into research for new drugs. So it's quite a complicated debate to have with people who are not necessarily used to thinking about some of these things. And given the strength of the UK's life sciences um, sector, we're very keen that the public is educated and 
informed about these things because once they understand the connection between the research, the bit of profit, but also the benefit to people, they're often much more altruistic and content for their information to be used for these sorts of activities. And so actually, regarding what you said, so, so, so indeed, like, transparency is very important, as we said, like, proper communication on, on what is done. But I, I also heard that there are some, some, some projects where people try to give control of the data to the individual people, where, as an individual, I could agree to share my data for certain purposes. So, and this, so it, would it be something to explore also for help data, where people would be the holders of their own data and they would share their data on an optional basis, not in general, but for specific projects? So at the moment, there's a big debate about how much people want to be involved in those conversations. Mm -hmm. And there are people who would really like to have debates with researchers, with clinicians, about how their data could make a difference to not just their own well-being, but perhaps future generations. So if you think about rare genetic diseases, for instance, there's a very active group of the public because they've got children often with very unusual um, illnesses which are not understood, where they want research to be done. But that requires a lot of work in terms of taking them through the steps to understand the consequences of giving their data, sharing it with other people, maybe in other countries, whether it may not be looked after as securely as it is in the UK. So it's a debate that's going on at the moment. As I say, I think our public is very altruistic. And once they've had the conversations about the benefit that can come from health and care data, they will often consent to maybe rather particular uses, as you suggest, same pandemics, because they've mm. come to understand that better, <laughs> or particular diseases where there's a family member with a condition that they really want to have better treatments, which requires research. So, yes, the answer to your question is yes. Okay, thank you. So, actually, going now to, to, to the urgent question of the pandemic. So, 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 clearly, we live in unusual times. And, the, and in these extraordinary situations, well, the rules that exist to share data might not be the same as the usual ones. And I think that one of the fear that you hear a lot in, in the public is also the fear that the Extra, extraordinary uh, like conditions would become the new normal. That we would be entering uh, a new regime where surveillance tools would be more generalized than they, are, than they used to be before the crisis. So what would you say to, to these people who would be afraid of maybe the, the, the kind of, uh, well, uh, the kind of uh, erosion of legal and ethical norms as, we, as we've known them so far? So there is a legal system which allows for a different use of health and care data in a, a national Im emergency in infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. and that has been the law for quite a long time, but probably hasn't been so well known to people as now because it hasn't, we haven't had these sorts of epidemics to such a degree. So what has happened is that the Department of Health has issued what are known as COPI notices. Uh, it's clinical inform it's cl information for the public anyway, about the use of their data in the pandemic, which means that for public health reasons, some of the usual rules do not have to be observed. But it doesn't mean that people can just take the data and do what they like with it. Some of the rules are still in place. So while the data can be used for diagnosis, for treatment, for trying to trace people with the disease and their contacts, that's all allowed. And those notices are on the website. And if people want to look at the COPI notices of the Department of Health and Social Care, the detailed accounts of how the data could be used in a pandemic and they're publicized in March, April. So 
there is strict legal uses now of using it in the pandemic and those will run until the 30th of September. And they may be extended if the pandemic is continuing and arrangements will be put in place for what happens on the 30th of September if the pandemic is easing and we'll go back to the some aspects of the old normal with data. Okay. So there are some aspects that have changed for the good. We can get agreement about certain sharing of data between GPs and hospitals, which were very slow and difficult. And there will be work to try and preserve that. But there were other uses of data where it will stop once those copy notices are withdrawn. And so indeed, so, so, and so you mentioned that actually, well, because of this like, intense exchange that we've seen so far, so so maybe the new solutions have emerged as well. So, so you would be optimistic also at the possible benefits that might uh, arise after we go back to the new normal. Well, one of the aspects of my role, I think, because of my um, position to try to safeguard the interests of the public, is to make sure that the Department of Health and Social Care gets this right, that the decisions are making about which uses can be maintained are the right ones. And I wouldn't do that on my own. That's with the GPs, with the hospitals, consultants, the nurses, all those with an interest in the proper use of data. So there will be conversations as we get towards September about which uses should stay and which will have to stop because they're only justifiable in a pandemic. Okay, and, and so actually just a slightly related question. So if, if I'm correct, in, in, the, in normal conditions, data are, are available by default, except if the people uh, opt out themselves from the system. So what is typically the, the fraction of the population who's opted out uh, and maybe did you investigate the reasons why they, they opted out? It's quite small. It's about 3% of the population. The opt-out only came in in the summer of 2018. And one of mm. the things that we don't know is, is that rather small number? Because a lot of people didn't know about it. There was a very big campaign but as I've said earlier, people are not necessarily interested in health issues until they're a patient or until they need care. So it may be that people didn't know very much and weren't interested. And there were a lot of fears when we were developing the opt-out that there would be huge numbers of people not wanting their data to be used, like 10% maybe. Mm. And one of the worries with that is that we are a rather unique in a rather unique situation in this country with a national health service free at the point of most care for a population of 65 million people, which has got data sets across the vast range of health and care available for study and to learn more about disease and treatment and so on. So we've got a very precious resource here People talk about Iceland, they talk about Estonia, which have a de data covering the whole country, but these are very small countries. So one of the things that people are interested in this country is in tracing the health and care record of an individual from birth to death and how we could learn a huge amount were we able to study that in a joined up way. But of course, that immediately gets in, us into a discussion about privacy and legal rights. No, completely indeed. And well, so far, actually, we, we've mostly talked about health and social care data, which is very expected due to your role. But in, in, in recent weeks and months, people have also started to be interested in mobility data, in contact uh, traces. Uh, well, there's, there's been this whole discussion about the possibility to have uh, a contact tracing app developed in the UK and under which conditions should it be accepted. So, so have you been involved somehow in the project and what would be your recommendations to make this, this project trust, trustworthy? So I have been involved in the 
project through two of my colleagues from my advisory panel of experts that help me with my work who have become members of the um, ethical advisory board which is advising the government on the ethics of the app and the themes that we've been talking about run through the work on the app in just the same way can people trust it will they know more about the individual than that individual is happy for them to know like location where are they so one of the issues that's been discussed about the app is will it show the location of individuals or just where there's a bluetooth signal of a phone which does not get linked to the identity of the person where is the data from the app stored what is the security so we're back to trust and the uh, safeguards people in this country expect to have. And I think one of the issues that those responsible for developing the app have been uh, working on is the fact that we have a rather different society in Europe and in the UK to some of the Asian countries where there are much stricter laws on what people can and can't do with their own information. So I think there are differences in, in how our app can work to uh, appreciate people's concerns about their rights and their um, legal, legal rights and um, independence to make choices as auto autonomous people. No, and, and, and I think that you're also very much correct that again, transparency and trust are extremely important and, and they're even more important because like contrary to certain countries in the UK and in Europe, well, the, the use of these apps would not be monitored it would be a decision of individual people to use that app for the common good. And, and I think that one of the key issues is that it's been recognized that for such apps to be of any use, you would need to reach a certain fraction of the population to get some sort of a critical size for them to be really useful in order to, to track back the contacts that infected people may, may have had. So, so would you have like some practical recommendations on how to promote this app and maybe how to well how to appease maybe people and some of their fears with what this app could lead to i think we have to recognize the beliefs in in people's own rights so the fact that our app will be voluntary people will consent to use this app is absolutely key I think the experts in the technology are saying that we need something like 70% of the population to agree to use it. So then we have to think about what the incentives are for people to want to use it. And you can understand that if, if several people in a family, hopefully able to mix with each other again, or several people in a workplace where the benefits of them all having the app because if somebody gets the disease, there will be immediate information for people that they um, do care about and feel for. That, that would be very helpful. Um, one of the interesting things I understand from the ep epidemiologists is that the nature of this disease is that you need to be able to identify the people that have it very quickly because mm -hmm. some of them don't have symptoms some do, and you need those test results to then quickly link up with the people they've been in contact with. And an app can do that in a way that the, if you like, the standard way of tracing people who've got a disease, which involves phone calls, visits, um, recording information, um, is, is slower. So I think the great advantage of the app would be that there will be instantaneous communication once someone's had a positive test to their contacts. So I think it's enabling the public to see the benefits and also the steps that are being taken to secure the data. Where is it? Where's it kept? How's it looked after? How long is it kept? App developers are saying 20 to 28 days so the anxieties that the public have can be addressed while they're deciding whether this is something they wish to consent to so those are some of the thoughts
Okay, so so actually we already have some questions from the public, but just before we turn to the questions of the public, I, I just wanted to ask you a last question about what you said is, so indeed time is the essence. Well, this is basically the uh, the argument for the use of uh, of apps versus traditional methods of, of tracing. But, but clearly you would also need to have the possibility to have very fast and rapid testing if you want to convince the population uh, that the, ga the time that you gain on, on, on the tracking and on the, on the tracing actually translates into uh, rapid testing to reassure your, love, your, your loved ones. So is it also something that the government is working on, trying to, to convince the people that indeed, like with the, with the contact tracing also comes rapid testing for the population? So at the moment, I think there's been a a step back from the fact that when, when the app was first announced, there was huge interest in it and people were mm. not um, convinced about how it fitted in with these other measures of uh, testing and tracing contacts. So that system, as I understand it, is now being put in place within a few days by the government. They've recruited a huge number of people to do that work and the app will now follow that within a relatively short time because they want to get this thing moving as quickly as possible. Um, so the going on to develop the aspects that will secure the um, public's confidence, looking at the results from the Isle of Wight, from which we've got some evidence where it's been tested. Um, and I think it, the preparation will helpfully, hopefully give the public a confidence it needs to sign up for the app. Okay, th thank you very much. So, so actually, uh, we have a few questions from the public. So, if you don't mind, I will I will read them. Okay. So, uh, so the first question comes back to this question to to the to this uh, well, debate on sharing data with private companies and the possible mo monetization of the data. And so, the question is, well, the CCPA in California includes the do not sell rule, but the G GDPR does not. What are your thoughts on this? Sorry, I, I'm afraid I didn't hear the beginning of the question. Okay. So the question was the CCPA in California. Oh, yes. Includes a do not sell rule, but the GDPR does not. What are your thoughts on this? A do not what rule? Uh, the do not sell. Do not sell. Yeah. I don't know if you know what this no, refers to. I I don't, I don't know how that works. I would need to hear more about it, but it, it's, um, okay. I mean, our, our Data Protection Act certainly yeah. is very clear about um, using uh, data in that way, but I don't, I don't know how that compares with uh, California, I'm sorry. Oh, well, me neither. Uh, so, so a second question is the following. So under what, if any circumstances, do you think citizens can or should be mandated to share personal data with public authorities? And what safeguards are required? I think it depends on which public authority you're talking about. Um, some people view their health and care data as one of their most precious um, sets of information, whereas most of us don't think in quite the same way about renewing our driving license or taxing our car. And I, therefore, I think there's a different level of sensitivity about how ready people are to share it with uh, their data with public authorities. But as I said, our experience from the work we've done with information to the public about health and care data is that a lot of their reservations can be overcome when they realize that this is for the good of others and the data can be secured. Part of the work I did a few, two or three years ago was to develop some security standards so that organisations which have health and care data have to look after it to a certain standard. So I hope the public has been reassured by that, that there are safeguards in place, but they need to be informed about just what those are and what the data is going to be used for and how long for and so on. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. I, I saw you. T I was back to the YouTube channel, and I could see you talk because there is a, a tiny delay between us. Uh, so, so actually, I had another question here. So let me try to find the right one here. Yes. So, 
about well about the location of the data and so so the person asks if there is some regulation in place to deal with data which could be held by organizations outside the UK. Yes, there, there, there are regulations. I mean, we're in a rather unusual situation at the moment because until January, we were part of the European Union and were subject to European data law. Um, we're now in a transitional phase and we know that some of our health and care data is sitting in continental Europe. So there's a lot of work going on on just what is the agreement between us and Europe about the safeguards for that, that data. And that, I, as I understand it, is a current conversation because we won't have the same legal requirements. But I hope that the government in this country will make sure that our people are protected as they are at the moment under the European arrangements. And, and actually, so going back to Europe, well, now the borders are not really open between countries, but there's going to be a time when there's going to be a reopening and people coming from abroad to the UK or to France or to, to Belgium. Or, and do you, do you think that there's going to be some sort of like agreement between countries to share data about, uh, I don't know, like... Uh, People who might be at risk of being of, of having the disease, in order to help countries control uh, like uh, unexpected resurgences of the of the disease. I would hope so, but I'm aware that there may be many people in this country who would not take such a, a view as that. And I think there may be ways in which our freedom to travel is going to be affected by some of the issues that have arisen from this. Um, pandemic, and I hope that we'll take a very mature view of how to protect our citizens, but also help them to have the freedoms they've enjoyed in the past. So I'd be very sorry if this puts barriers in the way of, for instance, university students being able to travel for part of their courses to learn other languages and so on. I mean, there's so many examples, but it's not part of my role, but I have views of it about it personally. No, yeah. So, so let me just read one question before I ask it to you because I was listening to you, so I cannot do two things at the <laughs> same time. So, uh, um, so, so, so someone asks: So, when a project goes via a research project, as you mentioned before, with data shared without consent, I assume that there are some extra safeguards to prevent misuse. Uh, what kind of safeguards are these? So in these situations when the data is not shared with consent? So one of the debates that I had when the role of da National Data Guardian was being established was whether I wanted to be a regulator who could punish people if they got things wrong. And one of the issues in our health service and care services, we've already got several regulators who can put sanctions onto people who get things wrong with data. In, in the case of health and care data, it's the information commissioner. And if people are interested to see more about her sanctions, they can look at the website. In, in recent months, the level of her sanctions that she can now uh, use has gone up to try to be more of a deterrent, particularly for big companies that lose people's data, um, of which there've been examples in the press not long ago. So I don't do that myself, but if I discover that those things are happening, then I would ask the information commissioner in that example if she thought it suitable to impose a sanction. So you can have too many regulators, and we've seen ourselves as there to advise, support, encourage good practice, but not to start with big sticks. Okay, and just a last question from the public. So someone asks if, well, I'm going to be restating his, his, his phrase slightly differently, but so are there like some different like conditions and regulations when data is truly anonymous and he, he has truly written in bold? So so actually, do you, do you think that there exists such truly anonymous data? And if such truly anonymous data exists, should we treat them differently? My understanding is that if you're absolutely determined 
to identify who the data belong to. That is possible. But there are strong legal sanctions in this country if people do that. And if it's shown that this is done, say, in a hospital where a member of staff looks at the confidential records of a patient when they have no right to do that, then they may lose their job, for instance. So I wouldn't want to claim that total anonymization in perpetuity is possible, but I think the sanctions that we have in our legal system and with the Information Commissioner as such, that there are very strong deterrents from people re-identifying data. No, okay, Th thank you. Thank you very okay. much. So, so, so I look at the clock and well, Time flies. It's it's been wonderful <laughs> to talk to you. So thank you very much for all of your all of your answers. So 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 maybe just just to conclude. So would you have some some final views that you would like to share with uh, me, the people who are listening to 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 us now? Well, we've touched on many of the things that I I think are really important. I do think that there can be some optimism about the increasing knowledge that people have now about health and care data and how it can benefit the wider good of society to be shared within the constraints that I've described. And so perhaps the thought that there's room for some optimism, that we've learnt more this awful disease, but also how to guard this special treasure that we have of health and care data and how to use it for the greater good of society. And the more people that sign up to that, the more we will have what is known as a social license to use it for the benefit of wider society. And I think that would be a big step forward. So thank you for all your questions, Reno, and those from the audience. And it's been a very interesting session remotely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, and thank you for finishing with this touch of optimism. Okay. It's, it's very important in these days. <laughs> so, so, so I would like to thank again our our speakers. So, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, all of you to watch us on YouTube now. It's uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the session as, as much uh, as I did. And well, I think it's time to conclude now. So, well, bye bye. Thank you, Rene. Thank you.